All right, as I mentioned in the first part of uh, our lectures on epigenetics, this is obviously an area that uh, uh, we really walked off into uh, to the world of the strange, highly controversial, uh, at least at this point. And uh, we're learning, I mean, the papers come out daily about it, uh, talking pro and con about this idea of epigenetics. And, and not that it doesn't exist. We know methylation exists. We know these forms exist. But... Uh, what effect does it have uh, on the phenotype itself? That's the controversy. But what I want to do here is talk first about some of the mechanisms, just kind of uh, remind you about some. Really, we've, we've actually talked about these uh, earlier, but remind you and, and point out that they really are epigenetic and then end up with some of the issues that bring up some of the controversies that we might see and that you might read about if you if you go through. Okay, so remember what the epigenome is. It's, this, it's these chemical changes that can occur either to DNA itself or to histone proteins uh, that control the, the genetic code. And generally we're talking about uh, epigenetics falls under regulation because we're usually talking about um, turning on or off genes. And generally what we're saying here is that we interact with DNA either to activate are, are depressed the expression of, of various genes in various sections. And we've really talked some about how this occurs. We've talked about, uh, when we talked about regulation, we talked about chromatin remodeling, right? Uh, and we've certainly talked about DNA methylation uh, and how that might work. So, you know, just to remind you about chromatin remodeling here, we, we talked about the fact that uh, we either have a sliding system or we have this lockdown system. It depends on what parts of the genes you're talking about. But basically what's occurring is that you have HDAC coming in, uh, acetylating these uh, histone tails that tends to switch it off and lock it down. Or you have uh, you have something like HATS, the acetylators coming in, which releases it and then it allows transcription to occur. Well, you can think about the fact that while this is a normal biological process, right? This is one of the ways that we shut down systems, uh, the genes that we don't want to be active in particular uh, tissue types. Uh, it can also be done as part of an environmental input, okay, as, as stress and all these other things that come along. So well, it, it can be induced in that form. And also, of course, we have this, this methylation that can go on. Uh, we can have unmethylated DNA. Again, it's usually at these GC you know, areas, which are called GC uh, islands, um, and there is a methyl tr uh, transferase uh, or DNA methylase, which uh, is really important because uh, you can have either hemimethylated systems or completely fully methylated systems. And what's important about this is that this enzyme complex is really when you have replication, it carries forth this whole process, right? It says, okay, this cell, uh, I'm replicating a cell that's going to be a skin cell. I don't need all these digestive enzymes turned on, so I leave them methylated if that if methylation is the shutdown. Again, methylation can turn it on or turn it off, but it, you know, let's pretend in this case it's a shutdown. Um, when the replication occurs, it sees it and says, oh, okay, I'm putting cytosine in here, but I need to methylate that cytosine. This, was, this is what can make these things uh, heritable too, right? Because if this happening in, in a genomic tissue, which, which you're going to produce, uh, you know, the uh, germ layers, then you're going to pass that information on. It's not going to be purely somatic. Uh, now, oxidative, we don't think that oxidative changes that could occur, which are also epigenetic, have any real uh, permanent mechanism, they tend to be uh, removed, but uh, they certainly affect the sonomic, uh, the uh, uh, lifetime output. Okay. Uh, but this particular enzyme does make it possible and it has been shown that methylation was transferable from generation to generation. And we'll, we'll talk more about that in a minute. Okay. Now, methylation usually inhibits transcription, but it doesn't have to. Okay. Uh, but it usually does inhibit transcription, particularly when we get it to the, uh, the promoter region. And we, we showed a couple examples back earlier with mutations when we talked about some of that. Uh, and again, this hits up these CG, these things called CG islands, a CP, that's the phosphate connector between these little guys. Um, it's usually, uh, if, we th if we think about the promoter, and we've talked a lot about promoters. So here's our, here's our true gene, right, our transcriptional unit stream, we have all these promoters. Often in those promoters, you find lots of CG repeats. Uh, these are known as CG islands. Um, and interestingly, if you have housekeeping genes, uh, histones and, and all the other genes that we need to transport and all those that we call housekeeping, they're, they're constitutively turned on and every cell needs 
these types of genes, those tend to be uh, unmethylated. Okay, if they have CG islands at all, uh, and a lot of them don't because you don't want to methylate them at all. Uh, but if they do have CG islands, they tend to be uh, unmethylated. So we know that that plays a role. This is how we kind of know that methylation is an inhibitor or an expression. And then we go look at tissue specific genes. Uh, we see that they are frequently methylated in these in these CG islands. It's one of the ways that that works. How does it work? Well, it's fairly simple. Uh, you know, you've got either an enhancer up here, which has got your CG island, or you just may have your promoter right, right in front of the coding sequence itself that has a CG island. So it doesn't have to be an enhancer, but it can be. Um, these, these binding factors, these proteins that have to come into play, the uh, TATA uh, box proteins, these others, uh, if it's methylated, it acts like a silencer, right? Because these methylated ones don't uh, attract or don't respond in the same way, uh, and you you end up with the uh, these transcriptional activator factors, these proteins not recognizing that as a lockdown point. Okay? And you can have that, and of course also you can have uh, just going back. It doesn't have to be actually at the level of DNA per se. Okay, uh, that you have a lockdown. It can be at the level of the nucleosome. Why is that? Well, if you have a lot of methylation going on. Um, there are these proteins that come in and recognize that, all right? And when they come in, what they do is they help recruit uh, HDACs uh, that will come in and deacetylate that whole region, right? Which means you basically lock down. So, the, so the, the methylation is occurring in the DNA, but the effect that it's having is actually locking down the nucleosome itself. And so you can have either one of those. You can have this compaction going on, or you can physically just have the, the DNA being modified uh, in an area where uh, you simply can't bring in the transcription factor a complex that you need. So what affects this epigenome? I mean, there's the ways that we think it occurs. Well, we've already mentioned in the last lecture, you think you have like behavior, exercise, or, or not, your, your stress type levels that you might have. And certainly we know diet is a huge player in, in uh, affecting the epigenome, the types of food we eat, the quality of that food, et cetera. And, and really, it comes into to a number of things. One is the types of nutrients that are brought in, the complexes. Um, a lot of nutrients are, are methyl donating, and that can be very good or it can be very bad in forms. Okay. Uh, again, I told you that that you know the adipose is. Uh, this signaling through mostly oxidative type things, which is, is usually not good, right? It's good if you're trying to store fat and, and reserves, but it's not good uh, otherwise, so it leads to problems. But they're also methyl uh, donating nutrients, and these tend to control gene expression. Now, sometimes they control in very positive ways, like, uh, you know, eating grapes and things and folic acids and things are very important. Uh, other times they can control it in, in negative ways. Let me show you a positive way, and then we'll talk about some of the, the negative outputs of it. A very famous set of studies that were done were looking at, at mice. These two mice right here from the same litter, okay, they're, they're identical. They're from a, from a strain of mice, a laboratory strain, uh, that essentially are I genetically identical. Okay, so that's where we start. And they're known as the goody mice, but goody is the kind of this classic color that you see here. Well, why are they so different? Well, they're so different because the agouti gene uh, normally in a, in a healthy mouse is only active for a short period of time. And the reason it's, it's active for a short period of time is that it gets methylated early on. And so it's during development, it's, it's active, but then it gets methylated and shut down throughout the, the life of the mouse. Okay? So this is what gives us a normal gray, you know, sort of a, what's called an agouti mouse, right? These big healthy mice. Well, if something prevents the methylation of this, and there are, are mechanical ways that's been done in the laboratory to do that, we can prevent the methylation of this, of this control region, and you get these obese mice. Why? Because you're getting constant production of the protein, the message, uh, and it's made constitutively throughout the, the life of the, of the mouse. What it results in are these massively obese mice. Um, they develop early onset cancers in various forms. They have uh, all the symptoms of diabetes and all sorts of things going on. And it's basically in this case because you, you failed to shut down a gene. Again, most methylation is a, shuts things down. These uh, don't methylate, and you get overexpression of it. Now, what's really interesting about these, if we take some of these, these obese mice and we breed them together, okay, 
uh, and we and we treat them in two different ways. Uh, once the mother's pregnant, uh, she's fed foods that are, are highly rich in uh, these methyl group donators. Okay, uh, what you'll see is that most of the progeny are going to be uh, healthy, and okay? she'll have a few that will be much like her and obese, but but in general you'll have a healthy group of progeny. Uh, if you don't supplement it, okay, if you give them just a normal diet, all the food they want, all these sorts of things, but not with these specialized methyl donators, uh, you end up with a majority of the offspring looking like the mother and being unhealthy. Right? So it clearly is something that uh, is a, a not purely genetic, but an environmental input that it takes. Now, if we were to take one of these, these healthy mice, and this is really fun, these F1s, and we breed those together, okay? What's interesting about it, so now you started out with a mother who was unhealthy, right? She's been just purely supplemented into these methyl groups have been produced. You take these mice, these F1s, and now produce F2s, this is what you get. You get normal mice. So what it's basically saying is that this methylation uh, provided protection of past generations, okay? It can be moved on. This idea has become known as epigenetic memory. And I said, when you know, a lot of the controversy about epigenetics is whether it's heritable or not. And that's the big, kind of the big fight, right? Yes, it, 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 there is evidence that it affects your, uh, your somatic changes as in these twins becoming you know, different, uh, but it, does it matter? Is it heritable? Uh, well, yes, it does appear that there are mechanisms and particularly methylation because of these enzymatic opportunities to, to keep the genes methylated, that if you end up uh, you know, with stress or something else methylating the system, it is clear that you can pass it on. And there may potentially be other types of uh, epigenetic changes that have epigenetic memory. It's uh, it's unclear whether that whether they do or not. Uh, but this has lots of ramifications for our society. You know, if you're if you're obesity, uh, that may pass on to your grandkids. Uh, stress during pregnancies could pass on to your grandkids, not just your children, but to your grandchildren. So it's a it's a major issue to to think through. Now this is a case where you know methylation um, has uh, it goes in one effect, and the other one though is 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 stress might you know in some ways be not be bad. There's uh there was famine uh, in the 40s and so in Sweden and in Denmark and other places. And an outcome of that was that some studies have shown that the, the, the males that came through this, this food, massive food shortage, which meant they were, uh, had a, a, a really st almost starvation situation for a couple of years, uh, bad systems. They um, actually, their grandchildren have increased lifespan, okay? Uh, individuals that had plentiful food, so nearby, but you know, are in situations where they had money and had food, uh, their grandchildren actually have decreased lifespan and heart, more heart disease, more diabetes. And this has been related potentially to epigenetics. Now, this is one of those big controversial ones. If you read anything, uh, if you Google this whole idea of uh, the Denmark um, famine or the Swedish famine, you'll see that, you know, one side saying it's epigenetic outcome, the other saying, oh, it could have, it's all sorts of other things. It could be social and all that. And, and it, it probably is. It's probably like anything else, like IQ or something. There's a genetic component and there's a cultural and, and, and you know, developmental component and parsing those out is always difficult, but probably there is some epigenetics here. Uh, so having, you know, the point is having a healthy lifestyle, uh, maintaining a weight in a reasonable way could affect your grandchildren. So it's something that we, we kind of need to start thinking through more about. Um, one place we do know that, that epigenetics plays a role is in cancers. Cancer is uncontrolled cell growth, right? Uh, normally, there's a lot of methylation going on. Uh, and and you know, once cells grow and we get the tissue types we need, we tend to, to stop it, right? We arrest those cells and they don't tend to be doing any uh, any mitotic divisions. Uh, and in fact, there, there's what's known as programmed cell death, cell senesce, and there's ways to, to basically take those cells and, and, uh, and uh, kill them and, and break the components apart. And these pathways are important for getting rid of old cells or cells that are degenerated or cells that have mutations or whatever. When cancer cells, what happens is that um, 
a lot of this methylation is not present, at least in some forms of cancer. Again, cancer is a very broad spectrum of, of, of activation activities, uh, but some of these have uh, much lower levels of methylation. Uh, and so what happens is because they're, they're much less methylated, uh, you get more genes active, you get these growth genes active. So these cells think they need to be growing. Uh, they grow, but they don't have the right cells to differentiate to, to you know, to make a, uh, the part that they're trying to make. So they just make a mass of cells and we call that, of course, a tumor. Okay. Um, so the big questions now in, in some of the cancer research is uh, we, for those, some of those versions of cancer that do appear to be based on these, these uh, methylation things. Can we, in fact, modify it? Is there a therapy that can be evolved? This is known as epigenetic therapy, um, and it's thinking about how can we go in and, and treat these by by you know attacking these sites and and methylating them and doing other things. And it's not just cancers. Um, cardiovascular disease is thought to be one where we have this you know this uh, overproduction of of these. Uh, proteins that then get put on the surface, the internal surface of our, our cardiovascular system, uh, diabetes and, and vein structures and, and you know, the poor circulations that comes with those, have to, there's some epigenetic influences there. So ideas is there, are there ways to attack that uh, by either uh, nutritional sources or by, uh, you know, directed uh, therapeutics. Uh, so it's really, those of you interested in medicine, this is going to be a huge area. It's a growing area because there is some some component of this that, that is uh, there. It's not just mutation, although clearly mutation themselves are very, very important in cancers as well. Okay. And then, you know, we need to think about behavior, right? How do these, these things change? And, and we, we've already talked about uh, uh, the fact that the, the hypothalamus um, and, and songbirds and things, you know, plays a role in, in, in expanding and uh, sending out new cells and all these sorts of things and how this, we have this uh, sort of uh, connectome, if you will, of, of the brain. This is the whole idea that how these, the neural system works uh, is very dependent on the shape and form of, that the cells take. And so, you know, uh, there's some growing evidence that some of these things, addictions and, and depressions and anxieties, at least some of those have epigenetic uh, influences. And again, many of this and things I'm going to talk about in a moment come from twin studies uh, where, you know, one twin is, uh, might have the disease and the, and the other one not, even though they should both have the genetics, uh, you know, that lead to the disease or lead away from the disease, they don't. Um, how do those things work? Or one of them is an addictive personality, one's not. Um, and so there's just a few examples of some studies. Okay. Um, there's a couple studies out about behavior. One is uh, depression and protein synthesis. Um, and it also has to do with uh, sort of uh, uh, the protein synthesis in some depressed uh, individuals, and particularly those that are at the suicidal level, uh, have certain proteins shut down. One of the ways we think that happens is through this scaffolding. Remember that, that when you make up a, a ribosome, it has ribosome RNA. And ribosome RNA has these complexes part of it. Well, some of that RNA can be methylated in ways that, that make it misfold and, and not actually do its job correctly. Uh, so in this case, we're downregulating. And, and in general, transcription of a number of proteins in uh, AD, which is uh, Alzheimer's patients, uh, tends to, the, the neural systems tends to be regulated. And so <clears throat> what we see is uh, either an increase or a decrease in methylation. And in this particular case, we're talking about an increase in methylation, which means you have a shutdown uh, of, of various uh, systems. And so th there's a couple of studies. One is, is there's a, uh, a clear, uh, in those individuals that were in control situations, um, they had uh, X amount of uh, RNA production. In other words, you could measure messages, right, by looking at the transcriptomes, looking at the number of messages were out there. And those individuals that were highly depressed in suicidal states or did in fact commit suicide in some cases uh, had uh, much lower expression and much higher rates of methylation. So it apparently plays a role uh, in these. And it's one of the things that, that's been lo being looked at as far as, uh, again, how um, how the system and behavior can be. Uh, other studies from, from Max Planck in Germany and, and actually from Emory a few years ago uh, looked at stress uh, in the sense of uh, 
you know, trauma that had occurred. And they had, you know, this one study, 169 individuals, uh, 61 of them you know, exhibited some type of uh, post-traumatic stress disorder. And uh, some proportion of them reported childhood abuse. And there seems to be a clear relationship between gene expression and abuse uh, victims and not. Uh, the epigenetic markers increased, in this case, 12-fold. Other studies have been 7-fold, 8-fold, or whatever. But clearly, stress in various levels uh, increases the amount of uh, methylation, oxidative damage, and other things, which probably turns off the right, you know, genes in the wrong places. So apparently, there are marks left by, uh, by child abuse and other things. Interestingly, uh, some of the more recent studies have suggested that uh, females um, actually uh, uh, have about twice as much uh, effect of these abuse issues uh, the, as far as methylation and other things, that, it, that it's much higher in females. Uh, and, and, you know, there's, there's, there's pretty clear data that uh, things like uh, even in normal or normal, in an unabused or, or, or situations where you, you have just a, a, a no history of any problems, uh, the, the, the hypothalamus in females is, is much highly more highly uh, methylated than it is in males. And we saw that in other things. We saw these expression studies, remember back in muscle? We said there's all kinds of different genes turned on in, in male muscles that's not present in females, and there's some in females that aren't turned on in males. Uh, a lot of that has to do with actually methylation and shutdown. And it true, it's true here as well. Apparently in uh, these abuse cases, uh, it tends to be uh, uh, more common in, in females that you have these epigenetic changes. And then the last place I want to go is, is really talking about these things that are what are called non-Darwinian traits, because that's really where all this falls, okay? Uh, these traits that occur uh, that really don't appear to be under natural selection. And, and non-Darwinian ideas have been around for, I mean, forever, and there's all kinds of different views of saltatorial evolution, uh, where things just kind of jump really quick, and, and the, all of a sudden you have it. Uh, I just gave a little example of radiation here, which happens very rapidly uh, in Australia, once marsupials got there, why did that occur? Well, was it all these niches and in, in natural selection came along, or was it this, these chance changes due to, to genetic drift and all this? These are non-Darwinian. But for our purposes, the ones we want to talk about here are things like uh, uh, altruistic behavior. That's been a big question. Why, are, why, why do we come, where did that come from? You know, that doesn't fit very well, and it even though neo-Darwinianists have, have molded that into their models, it doesn't fit very well. Now, what is altruistic behavior? Well, you know, there's a dolphin saving dogs, right? Uh, and people uh, pushing children out of the way, even though there's a high risk that they could die from it or something else, or rescuing, you know, seeing a child in the, in the water. It's not your genetic progeny. You have no genetic relationship to it. Why would you jump into the water to try to save it? Why would you just stand there and say, you know, it's, I, it's genetic, but we're prone to do those sorts of things. And it, it's common in the uh, in the animal, animal world, mammal world, at least, that you do have some altruistic behaviors. Well, that's non-Darwinian, right? Uh, and, and there's there's a range of it, right? Some people are highly altruistic. Other people are completely non-altruistic. And so it's, it's an interesting issue. And I think it you know, personally, I think it probably plays a role in, in some of our politics. So it'd be an interesting study, uh, I think, to kind of see uh, over time, have we have we progressed to being less altruistic, you know, and, and those individuals that uh, take one political view versus another, is there a difference in methylation or something? Uh, I don't, I, just way off the beam there, I don't have any idea that that's true or even a, a good idea, but it's uh, fun to think about it. And then things like, uh, you know, sexual orientation and stuff have even been discussed as potential. Um, and this comes from um, the ideas that uh, twins, if you take these, these homozygotic twins, that uh, only about 20% of the cases do when you have uh, homosexuals uh, of one twin is the other one also homosexual. So, it, it, so if they have the same genes and they're coming along, what's driving it? Well, obviously there's, there's um, uh, lots of... Uh, uh, social input. There's lots of all sorts of things, but it turns out it also has to do potentially, well, at least from some studies, and I'm not supporting or refuting any of this, just reporting the studies, um, that there are a couple of different genes 
uh, that are involved that get that in, in homosexual twins that are actually more methylated and turned down. These, and one of these genes has to do with uh, neural pathways, and so it has to do with the ability of testosterone uh, in, in the case of males uh, to be to be affecting the system, and, and it occurs early on in the system. So there's some there's some really in, you know, interesting discussion about uh, sexual orientation and how. Uh, potentially, you, you know, you develop this non-Darwinian trait, right? Uh, because two females or two males are not going to pass genes on uh, together. So, how does that uh, carry forth, and where does it, where does that come from? It might, in fact, have some epigenetic background, although you know, clearly it has a social background and other things to it as well. Uh, just interesting area. It's it's one that uh, if you read about it, it's highly controversial, and it's one of those that you can think about. Okay, I learned this in genetics and does it play a role? Does it not? I think in the next, uh, you know, decade or so, we're going to be learning more and more about um, how much of this is true and correct, and you know, and then how much of it is just fantasy, uh, and then the part that is true, you know, how is that going to play a role in, in understanding cancers and disease and and heritability of various behaviors and those sorts of things. All right, well, that's really all I wanted to say about epigenetics. I think that's a nice little run through and it kind of opens the door for you to look into that room if you want to and investigate things. Certainly if you're going to the medical field or you're going into fields where pharmaceuticals or even you know in veterinary school, uh, thinking about the way animals are treated and what happens to them and what kind of products, you, you know, outcomes that produces over their lifetime uh, will be important in terms of, of these acquired uh, variations that might occur.